Hello Hunters, and welcome back to Super Fan Natural. Angels, what are they all about? Protecting the weak? Destroying the wicked? Depending on your religious beliefs or fantasy preferences, it could be either. In Supernatural, angels are usually more bad than good, except of course for Castiel. He is our perfect good noodle who can do no wrong. However, in this show, not all angels are the same. Amongst the God Squad, you'll find different ranks, groups, organizations, even some different subspecies with unique powers and abilities. In this video, I'll do my best to list and describe the various types of angels that appear in the show. And by types, I mean like what I said before, ranks, groups, organizations, and subspecies. First, let's get some general info out there for anyone who isn't familiar with their basic mechanics. Angels are spiritual beings hand-created by God himself. And when I say that, I mean as far as we know, he personally made every single full-blooded angel in existence. As I go through this list, I'll talk about how different angels had different jobs and roles. However, there is one overarching mission for the entire species, protecting creation. Everything the angels did was supposed to be in service of maintaining God's world and protecting its inhabitants from supernatural threats. The key phrase there being supposed to be. God eventually decided to bail on heaven, and once he left, his kids kind of lost the plot a little bit. Oh yeah, angels consider God to be their literal father, and they think of each other as biological siblings. Anyway, angels might be charged with protecting the earth, but they aren't originally from here. Instead, their home is heaven, and that's where they can exist in their true form, which is described as a multidimensional wavelength of celestial intent. We never get to see what that looks like exactly, which is probably because it's supposed to be too much for the human body and mind to comprehend and people who do see it usually end up with their eyes burnt out. We do know that they have wings made out of spiritual energy, and that these wings have feathers that can fossilize. On Earth, they don't have physical bodies. Instead, they appear as either rays of light or wisps of bluish-white smoke. If they want to do much of anything, they've got to possess someone, and I've made a whole entire video outlining every type of possession in Supernatural, which you should check out for more info. But the basic rules for angels are that they can only safely jump into certain people, and that they've got to get that person's permission before they can take them over. Once they've secured a meat suit, angels become some of the most powerful creatures in the show. They've got a buttload of abilities, including super strength, telekinesis, telepathy, and mind control. They can mimic voices, turn invisible, and perceive things on the molecular level. Their wings allow them to teleport not only around the earth, but also to and from heaven. Speaking of which, a strong connection to heaven gives them incredible healing abilities, including the power to revive the recent dead, and with enough juice, they can even time travel. These tricks are possible thanks to a substance called Grace. Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. Grace isn't just magic superpower juice. It's what fundamentally makes angels angels. If an angel's grace is fully removed, then they somehow gain a soul and become more or less human. One thing that's kind of unique about angels is that without God's help, there really isn't a way to make more. Angels can't reproduce with each other, and while they can mate with humans, this can only produce hybrids. So yeah, whenever an angel is killed, that's a permanent decrease in heaven's numbers. That's a bigger deal than you might think. See, angels don't just live in or guard heaven, they actually power it. So if too many angels die, then heaven could shut down, which would cause all of the souls resting there to be cast down to the earth as ghosts. As far as we know, there's nothing preventing God from making more, he just doesn't. When angels die, their consciousness is sent to the empty, where they sleep forever, and apparently, most of them dream about their biggest regrets in life. Lovely. Let's start with the lowest rung on the divine ladder, your basic angel. In fact, this type is so basic that it doesn't even have a fancy title. Though they're sometimes referred to as lower order angels, and one time Zachariah referred to them as grunts. Honestly, that's a pretty fitting description. These are the foot soldiers and office drones. They're Heaven's general workforce, the ones that get most of the actual work done without getting anything to show for it. This is not only the most numerous group, it's also the most nebulous. Pretty much any angel without a fancy title or job probably falls into the grunt category. Some of the more common tasks these angels are given include fighting battles, protecting important people, guarding the souls in heaven, and taking out enemies. They are occasionally given more important tasks. For example, the angel that is legally required to be your favorite, Castiel, was sent to rescue Dean from Hell, which was a really, really, really important job. That was probably because Cass wasn't quite at the bottom of the totem pole. See, these soldier angels are often grouped into teams known as garrisons, which are headed by a captain, which I'm pretty sure Cass was the captain in Season 4. These captains don't necessarily have any more raw power, but they do carry a bit more authority. 
Beyond that, there are some more specialized positions within the Grunt class. Uriel was introduced as some kind of specialist, though we don't know what that was. And before God chose Metatron to be his scribe, he apparently held some kind of secretarial position. Also, some angels like Gedriel and Virgil were given very unique assignments, such as guarding Heaven's weapons or defending Eden. These kinds of specialized jobs don't really carry any unique powers that we know of. Really, the thing that distinguishes the grunts from other angels is the amount of autonomy that they're afforded. All angels are supposed to follow someone's orders, but some classes are allowed a certain degree of freedom in how they accomplish their goals. Not the standard angels. They're expected to do exactly what they're told without expressing any real feelings or opinions on the matter. Don't misunderstand, they do have emotions and free will, they're just not really expected to use them except for however senior management wants them to. This category becomes harder to keep track of as the series goes on and Heaven descends into chaos and reforms several times. However, I feel safe declaring that if an angel isn't explicitly stated to be part of any other class or subspecies, then they're probably a regular average run-of-the-mill standard angel. The next two classes that we'll talk about are roughly equivalent to the grunts in terms of power and rank. However, unlike the standard angels, these groups have highly specialized roles and are equipped with unique abilities they use to do their jobs. The first are cupids, also called cherubim or cherubs. These angels do exactly what you'd think cupids would. They advise homeowners on Canadian property laws. Just kidding, obviously they make people fall in love. This is done by inscribing special sigils onto people's hearts that induce feelings of love and attraction. All it takes is a single touch and bam, you love someone. Congrats. The Cupid's love touch, <laughs> ew, comes from their bow, which thankfully isn't an actual bow and arrow. Instead, it seems to be a metaphysical object that's part of their anatomy, like their wings, and it can be manifested as a tattoo on their palm. Beyond that, they seem to have most of the standard angel powers. Culturally, Cupids are pretty different from their rest of their siblings. They don't really act like soldiers or corporate employees, and some of them openly display strong emotions in a way that really wasn't common until later seasons. Also, their handshake is a big old bear hug. However, don't let their kind nature and pacifism fool you into thinking that they're not involved in some shady shit. Their purpose isn't to make sure that lonely people find love. No, their main job is to ensure that certain bloodlines continue, and it seems like this mostly pertains to families that act as vessels for angels. For example, John Winchester and Mary Campbell were foretold to produce the perfect vessels for Michael and Lucifer, so they were shot with Cupid's metaphorical bow. So yeah, they may seem sweet, but their job is questionable at best. The second class of specialists among the lower order are Redizian. These guys operate as divine medics that treat other angels who've been wounded in battle. Now all angels have incredible healing powers, so it's not clear if the Redizian have more powerful abilities, or if they're just more skilled healers, or if angels are just harder to heal than people, we don't really know. What we do know is what they do when they find an angel that can't be healed. See, another power that most angels possess is called smiting, and how it seems to work is that an angel will touch someone and fill them with holy energy or something, which burns up their insides and vaporizes their eyes, leaving behind a burnt out corpse. Redizian have a special form of smiting that doesn't just kill its target, but also completely vaporizes them on a molecular level, leaving behind nothing but a bunch of pink goo. This ability is meant to be used as a way of mercy killing mortally wounded angels, since it's described as being completely painless. Redizian also have another ability that helps them in their hunt to heal. They can sense pain and are drawn to it like a beacon. Sounds useful, right? Well, it can actually cause some massive problems. See, Riazian don't really come to Earth very often. They mostly operate in Heaven, where they're amongst other angels who feel pain in a similar way to them. However, when one is thrust amongst humanity, they're exposed to new dimensions of emotional pain that they really aren't equipped to deal with. Think of it like this. If you met a 15-year-old who was upset because they'd just been dumped, would you consider them worthy of a mercy killing? No, hopefully not, because as a human, you know that that situation sucks, but it's not the end of the world. A Redizian wouldn't necessarily know that, at least not if a teenager was upset enough. They're not properly trained to understand human emotional pain, so if it's forced upon them, then you've got the potential for a really bad situation. Okay, that covers the lower classes, now let's shift wildly to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and talk about the oldest and most powerful angels in existence, the Archangels. Unlike the other classes or orders or breeds of angels, we actually have a definitive number of archangels, and it's not in the thousands or hundreds or even twenties. There are only four, Michael, 
Lucifer, Raphael, and Gabriel. Well, actually, there were technically eight that we knew of, but the other four were duplicates from other universes. These guys are borderline a different species than the rest of their host. Like, if we compare the rest of this list to different breeds of dog, then the archangels would be prehistoric dire wolves. They are literally the oldest of God's creations, predating not only angels and the earth, but also kind of the concept of time itself. In fact, the whole reason God made them was to help him create the universe, sort of. If you're not familiar with Supernatural's deep and not at all confusing lore, God has a twin sister called the Darkness. Back in the day, she didn't like it when he created the other things, so she would destroy anything he made. Eventually, God decided to seal his sister away, but he couldn't do it alone, so he created the Archangels to help him fight back against the Darkness, and together, they won. Once God started making stuff, he actually chose to remain behind the scenes most of the time, and would only interact directly with a handful of beings. The Arcs were among those who were allowed FaceTime with the big guy, and he positioned them as Heaven's five-star generals. After God bounced, the Archangels didn't have anyone giving them orders, so from about 10,000 or so BC to 2010, Archangels were the ultimate authority in Heaven. Keep in mind, it wasn't all four of them in charge at the same time. By the time God had left, Lucifer had already been locked up for crimes against humanity, then at some point later Gabriel just got stressed about his family's drama, and he ran away from home and assumed Loki's identity. That just left Mike and Raffi in charge until the season 5 finale, when Michael got pulled into the cage by Sam, leaving just Raphael in charge. After he made it known that he wanted to restart the apocalypse, Cass started a civil war and ultimately won after absorbing millions of souls from purgatory, and used their power to explode him. And with that, the Archangel's regime was ended, for the most part. As I said before, the Archangel's authority doesn't just come from their age, but also their power. They are really, 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 really powerful, which makes sense because, you know, they were invented to fight God's twin. They can do basically anything that other angels can do, just better and with much more ease, including big things like reviving the dead and time travel. They have a lot more abilities, but I really don't think an itemized list would do justice, so I'll just give a noteworthy example from each of the four. Gabriel could create real, solid objects out of thin air, including the cast and setting of TV shows. Raphael's mere presence on Earth wiped out power to the eastern seaboard of the United States. Lucifer created demons by twisting and corrupting the souls of naughty humans, and also he would later go on to create the new god. Finally, Michael was able to open a rift into purgatory with just the snap of his fingers. And that might not seem as impressive, but keep in mind that finding a way into purgatory was the entire plot of Season 6. It's also really hard to depower an archangel, since even if you remove their grace, it'll grow back eventually. At least, that's how it seems. They can also bypass some of the rules of possession, and there really aren't many things that can kill archangels. Let's move to the middle of the corporate ladder as we discuss the Seraphim. Before I go any further, I have to say that a lot of the information in this section is predicated on the idea that the angel Zachariah was a Seraph, even though that was never actually confirmed. If he's not, then I wouldn't really have much to say about this class. The only angels that were confirmed to be seraphs were Castiel, after season 5, who never had a normal place in heaven, and Acobel, who was a renegade. So, assuming that Zack was one, then seraphs are heaven's middle management class that command the lower orders of angels and report directly to the archangels. They act as the buffer between the big bosses and the lower drones, and at least part of their job seems to be making sure that the senior management doesn't have to deal with the minutiae of heaven's day-to-day -day operations. An important aspect of that is thinking in a more creative way than lower angels. Seraphs not only seem to have a bit more creative freedom in their work, they also seem to be a bit more familiar with humanity than both their subordinates and bosses. Zechariah was one of the most human angels in the series. He could quote pop culture and throw around business jargon. He was generally more social than his siblings. This relationship to humanity isn't unique to Zach. Acobel was assigned to walk amongst humanity in order to observe and snitch on them. Which, you know, isn't a job you give someone who can't blend in. Cass wasn't originally a seraph, instead he was granted the position by God after season 5, so basically after he spent a whole year living amongst and fighting on the side of humans. Their higher status comes with a greater amount of power. For example, Zachariah was able to give Dean cancer and remove Sam's lungs. Both he and Cass could manipulate memories in a pretty extreme way. Hell, Cass was somehow able to get Sam's body from Lucifer's cage, you know, one of the most airtight and inaccessible places in Supernatural. Honestly, that's a topic worthy of a video of its own. Anyway, Seraphim are quite powerful, but they still don't have nearly as much juice as Archangels. They're right there in the middle. 
Next up, we've got a class that many angels don't even know exists. They're Heaven's Intelligence Division, who I've personally dubbed the CI Angels because they're basically Heaven's Central Intelligence Agency. We don't have a ton of information about them, but we do know of two roles they play. Firstly, they gather information, which, yeah, that's kind of important. However, they're also employed to solve problems in a more discreet way, and I'm not just talking about problems that came from outside of the homeland. See, sometimes angels act up, or they don't do what they're told, and that can put a wrinkle in senior management's plans. Now, the big bosses have no problem with just vaporizing subversives, but sometimes that just doesn't solve the problem. The CI angels have been trained to use special techniques that allow them to mess with their siblings' minds, and they can use them to alter personalities, rewrite memories, plant suggestions, and even create mind-controlled sleeper agents. What I'm trying to say is, they're really shady. It's hard to say exactly where they fit into Heaven's original command structure, since the only time we see their operation is when they've actually seized control of a big part of Heaven. Still, we know that Naomi was given assignments by the Archangels, in fact, it's possible that's who created the division in the first place. It honestly doesn't seem like these guys are a separate breed of angel, they never really show off any unique powers. Instead, they're an organization composed of specially trained regular angels, led by a director named Naomi, who's played by Stargate's Amanda Tapping, baby! In terms of her rank, I'd say she's probably a seraph, but you could argue that she's something unique. I don't know if this division still exists by the end of the show. It doesn't seem like it, but who knows for sure. Before we move on from the Heavenly Host, we've got one more class to discuss. The Grigori, or Watcher Angels. These were some of the first angels ever sent to Earth in order to watch over and protect humanity. At least, that's what I assume they were supposed to do. Cass refers to them as an elite unit, and the few we see on the show refer to themselves as warriors. So despite being called Watcher Angels, they were probably built for combat. At the end of the day, though, it doesn't really matter what their original job was, because they didn't do it. At some point after being sent to Earth, the Grigori decided to abandon their mission. We don't really get a clear explanation as to why that happened, but based off of how some of them talk about humans, it seems like they felt superior and didn't think mankind deserved their services. Naturally, this pissed off the rest of Angeldom, and the Grigori were nearly eradicated, though a handful of them did survive. Like the CI Angels, it's not clear if the Grigori were a special breed of angel, or if they were basic angels who were given special training. We do see them use an ability that I don't believe we ever saw from other angels. All of the Grigori we see fed off of human souls for reasons that are not really clear. They don't just pull the whole soul out and jam it down their craw, instead they would suck out little bits at a time, which caused spiritual damage that couldn't be healed even by angelic means. Like I said, we don't get a detailed explanation as to why they did this, but Tamiel claimed that it kept him alive and hidden. Beyond that, we don't really see any other unique powers from the Watchers, however, they do have unique weapons. Instead of carrying standard angel blades, the Watchers carry legit short swords, which are some of the sickest props in the entire show. I want one so freaking bad. By the end of the series, it seems like the Watchers are completely extinct, though to be fair, everyone thought that about them before, so they could still be around, I guess. So that's all of the varieties of feathered friends you could find working for Heaven. Now let's talk about the angels that decided they no longer wanted to be part of the God Squad, the Fallen Angels. This is actually kind of a frustrating group to talk about, because we see several different angels who are considered Fallen, and each case is just a little bit different. There's really no better example of this than Castiel, who fell at least three times in the show. His first fall came at the end of Season 4, when he rebels and attempts to prevent the apocalypse. He spends Season 5, quote, cut off from heaven, meaning that he was still an angel with most of his abilities, however he couldn't heal, revive the dead, or smite demons. His batteries eventually ran out, and by the end of the season he was basically human. We don't really get an explanation for why that happened, but a common theory is that being cut off from heaven meant that his grace didn't replenish like it normally would. So, then that's how falling works, right? You get to stay an angel until you burn through your grace? Well, not always. Cass's second fall came in Season 7, after the Leviathans ripped out of him. He was left with amnesia for a few months, during which time he thought he was human, and even after regaining his memories, he still didn't actively go back to heaven. However, he still remained all of his heavenly powers and perks. In fact, during this entire period, which lasted until early Season 8, he never became any less angelic. Some people argue that this wasn't a fall, but it totally was because his blood counted as blood of a fallen angel for the leviathan killing weapon. 
This isn't the only case of fallen angels keeping their powers. Lucifer, the Grigori, and Metatron were all MIA for millennia, yet they still retained their mojo into the mid-2010s. Lucifer makes sense, he was an archangel, and like I said before, it doesn't seem like they're capable of running out of grace. Also, I personally believe that the reason the Grigori fed off of people was to maintain their grace, but that's just a theory. So yeah, I guess sometimes angels just don't lose their powers after bailing on heaven. Castiel's third fall has a lot less ambiguity to it. Metatron completely removes his grace, which turns him human, and this is only reversed by Cass stealing another angel's grace. Actually, even that doesn't completely restore him, as Cass gradually burns through the stolen power until he retakes the remainder of his own grace. The only other angel we see go through this type of fall is, fittingly, Metatron himself. When this happens, the angel basically inherits the vessel they're occupying at the time, and just live there until they die. I assume this ejects the soul of the original occupant, but we don't really get an explanation for that. That's the most extreme fall that Cass undergoes, however, there is one angel who took it a step further. Anna Milton is the first fallen angel to appear in the show, and as with the last example, she had removed her grace and become human. However, instead of stealing someone else's body and life, she somehow rigged it so that she would be reborn as a human. I really have no idea how she managed to do that, but it worked, and she lived as a human for 20-some years without knowing anything about her previous life, though some of her old memories did occasionally leak into her mind. After she regained her grace, Anna became an angel again, and in the process, her human body was destroyed, however, she managed to reassemble it and inhabit it, making her one of the very few angels in the series to use a vessel without having to get any permission. Okay, I think that's enough about fallen angels. So, that's all the original, full-blooded angels, but hold up, because we're not quite done yet. I said before that angels couldn't make more angels by banging each other, but they could produce hybrids by sexing humans. These hybrids are known as Nephilim, which I guess is both the plural and singular term, even though it really shouldn't be. Nephilim have the potential to be some of the most powerful and dangerous beings in Supernatural, because they possess both a grace and soul. Those are two of the most potent forces in the universe, and when you mix them together, they power each other up further. As a result, Nephilim tend to be stronger than any of their three parents, and they pretty much have the best of both species, as they wield great cosmic powers and angelic wings, but they get to feel and experience the world in a human way. It's not all upsides, though. Nephilim do come with their own unique weaknesses. Like angels, a Nephilim's grace can be removed, rendering them human. And you might think that wouldn't have as much of an impact on them since they're already halfway there, right? Not right? They actually need their grace to keep the two halves of their ancestry balanced, and if it's removed, they can actually become terminally ill. We only get to see two Nephilim in the series, the first being Jane, who didn't really seem all that special. She was really strong and could see angels, and she slapped Cass around pretty easily, but ultimately she didn't show off any cool new powers, and a simple angel blade put her down. However, the second Nephilim we got was Jack Klein Winchester Rooney, the son of Lucifer who, I'll remind you, was an Archangel. Jack is unquestionably the most powerful character in the show. Before he was even born, he casually punched holes in reality, a few months later he accidentally resurrected Cass from the Empty, he would later go on to kill a version of Michael from an alternate universe, and he caps off the series by stealing God's powers and replacing him. Now admittedly, Jack is a very unique case, but he does work as an example of the upper limit of Nephilim's powers, and good god is it a seriously high limit. Before I move on to the final type of angel, I've got to talk about three instances in which characters I've already discussed temporarily digivolved into unique, ultra-powerful angelic beings. First, at the end of Season 6, Cast takes in a metric assload of souls from Purgatory, gaining godlike powers and immunity to regular angel weaknesses. He declared himself to no longer be an angel, though Death claims that he was and was just mutated. This goes away once he returns the souls. Later, Metatron powers himself up using the Angel Tablet. He doesn't become nearly as powerful as God's DL, but he does become strong enough to blow away Holy Fire like nothing. This went away after the tablet was smashed. Finally, there's Jack, who went through a few changes. Like I said in the last section, Jack wasn't an angel. However, by the end of Season 14, he kind of was. He'd lost most, if not all, of his soul, and absorbed the Apocalypse World Michael's grace, meaning that he had all the ingredients to be an angel rather than a Nephilim. It's not entirely clear when or even if he loses the raw power from this event, but he does regain his soul in Season 15. Alright, this video is getting kind of long, so let's wrap things up with one last class of angels, and I saved this one for last because it's the newest group of angels. See, I've been a little tricky with some of my language in this video, specifically when I said that God created all of the angels and he's the only one who could do it. 
That was true up until season 14, when a supercharged Jack managed to do what was thought to be impossible and created brand new angels by transforming a group of humans. We don't get any information about how he did it, he just kind of puts his hands up to their temples and their eyes glow blue and voila, new angels. We also don't really know anything about these people, how powerful they are, what abilities they've got, we don't even know if they have wings. All we know is that Jack and Duma recognize them as angels. At the very least, they're angelic enough to help maintain Heaven's power grid, which is why they were created in the first place. Also, because Jack eventually became God, I technically wasn't lying when I said that God created every single angel in existence. Alright, I think that's way more than enough Heaven talk for today. If you fancy this video, then be an angel and grace me with a like, comment, and subscribe. Sorry if you noticed more stuttering than usual, I got good days and I got bad days. I'm currently working on three videos that I'm really, really excited about, and I can't wait to share them with you all. They'll be out soon enough, but for now, carry on.